finish up. A uh, couple of disclaimers. Um, I put this project together rather quickly because I wasn't actually expecting to present today. Uh, originally, we were going to have Kate Fish, uh, who is the wife of Pastor Pat Fish over at Holy Redeemer. She is a marriage and family therapist. We had originally scheduled her to come and talk about forgiveness in relationship and uh, helping our kids learn how to forgive. Uh, unfortunately, the doctor put her on bed rest because she's very pregnant, due in early April. Um, I don't want to be Pastor Pat and maybe having a newborn during World Week. <laughs> oh. um, so, unfortunately, she was not able to join us today. So, uh, we wish we wish her all the best. And so, uh, I then decided, okay, well, I recently had a class on dementia, so I'm going to relay the information of what I learned uh, to you folks, as well as some of the things that I've been wrestling with around theological questions with dementia. Now, I'm not a medical professional. I am a theologian. Uh, so I will be approaching this mostly through theological eyes, uh, but we will talk a few things medically uh, with dementia just because it can help us with our understanding of it. Um, and uh, my plan is that um, if we get, if we don't get through the entire presentation today, that I will continue this discussion next week. Um, and if we do get through the entire presentation, well, there's still plenty of things to talk about, so we'll continue the discussion next week. <laughs> Any way you look at it, we're going to continue this discussion next week. Uh, so uh, feel free to interrupt, ask your questions. Uh, I really want this to be conversational format. If you have stories that you want to share that are pertinent to what we're talking about, please share uh, those stories, um, and uh, we'll go from there. So let's go ahead and get started. Can you all see that OK? Mm -hmm. I promise that it won't be this hard to read for the rest of this mm -hmm. time. Yeah, do you, do you want more lights off? Will that help? I get there. Yeah, I was thinking it's a lot. Is this the you, the government issued you, or? <laughs> However you want to define it, how do you know that you are you? You. <laughs> I guess I'm just, it's like a philosophy one-on-one -on -one kind of question, I think. Okay, so um, anyone want to share with a larger group? What how do you answer, how do you, how do you know that you are you? Cedric said that about the driver's license. The driver's license. <laughs> Sam's was good too. The mirror. The mirror? <laughs> the mirror, mirror on the wall. Look in the mirror, it still Who's looks that? like mirror? it. Yeah, right. Who's the coolest dude? Man, cool. if he's blind, you'd <laughs> never know that he really is. I've never given any thought to him ever. Never given any thought to him? No. Has anyone ever given thought to that question? How do I know that I am me? I have, but mostly on like a. Uh, what is my vocation kind what of thing? What is my vocation? Okay, yeah. Yeah, I've seen that question, like, how do I know what I want to do with my life, or 
who I want to become, you know. So who am I at my core yeah. in terms of then what will I become kind of question. Right, yeah, exactly. So let's ask Kate Linda. What? How do you know that you are you? Because I am. <laughs> Somebody told me that I was. Somebody told me. Your name's Pete. <laughs> well, I think if uh, most people were to answer the question of how do I know who I am, we would talk about our identity, right? We talk about what makes us us. And some of the things that I think people would mention is that we talk about our personality. Well, I'm easygoing, or I'm a hard worker, you know, things of that nature. We talk about our likes and dislikes, you know? Well, I really love to golf. I really love chocolate cake. I really love Star Wars. You know, insert. I really don't like rock and roll. I really don't like insert name here. And so we talk about our likes and dislikes, our memories, our stories. Right, that's a big part of who we are. Right, our sharing our memories, how we grew up, uh, the experiences that we shared with growing up, the rules that our parents put forth for us in our households. Um, things we are proud of and maybe not so proud of that we did in our young adult years. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, all these different stories and memories that we like to share that remind us of where we came from and who we are. Um, our relationships, right? Our relationships hugely define who we are, right? I mean, because all of us were daughters and sons at one point. All of, uh, maybe a lot of us were siblings, maybe not. Um, some of us are uh, spouses or had significant others in our lives. Um, you know, we have all these different relationships that identify us uh, and who we are. Um, relationships with our friends, relationships with coworkers, those help make up our identity. Uh, our vocation, as Stephen said, you know, uh, a lot of young people wrestle with that. What am I going to do with my life? Who am I going to be? You know, who am I in terms of how I want to make my living in life. You know, those questions of our vocation are, are, are a strong part of our identity. I've heard that's not limited to young people. Though. I've heard Well, no, no. It's, <laughs> I was using that as an yeah. example. That's, no, it's the, you know, I'm, you know, uh, yes, I'm a young person. I wrestle every day with my understanding of vocation, and I'm sure uh, there's lots of you out there that still wrestle with that question, too, in some form or fashion. That, that one is one that will never be us. We will always be wrestling with that understanding of our vocations, who, who we are, in terms of uh, what God is calling us to do. And of course, our faith is a big identifier, right? We like to say that we are Christian, that we are Lutherans, you know, that we believe in Jesus. You know, that's a big identifier of who we are. So I think a lot of people, when we talk about who am I, they would say, well, I am this, and base it off of a lot of these categories. Now, this isn't an exhaustive list, but I think these are all, a lot of the heavy hitters that people would say as they try to say, well, this is who I am. It's like filling out one of those uh, matchmaker tests, right? Uh, and we also uh, come from a society where knowledge is power, right? Uh, the more you know, uh, the more uh, you can influence others, the more you can have a more successful career in life. Uh, knowledge is a huge component to our lives. Uh, we are a society that values knowledge. You know, example, uh, a lot of times we think a good doctor is one who's very knowledgeable. You know, my doctor's really good. He's very knowledgeable. She's very knowledgeable. Uh, how many of you like to watch Jeopardy? How many of you get really proud when you get the answer to a question right? <laughs> Right? Yeah, exactly, exactly. Trivia you know? nights. Trivia nights are big at, at bars and such. <laughs> we like to we like to test our knowledge. We like to think that we that we like to test ourselves, see if we know the answers to things. Uh, so knowledge is part of those. You know, most of us spent 13 to 21 years in school. Uh, 21 years, uh, that's all the way to the doctorate. Um, some of us spent more. <laughs> um, uh, as of uh, 2015, uh, the U.S. Census data showed that uh, we consider 88% of the population uh, had a high school diploma or GED. Uh, 
39% had some form of college education, whether it was a class or two or uh, something else. Um, or excuse me, 59%, not 39. 42% uh, had a, at least an associate's degree. 33% uh, uh, had at least a bachelor's degree, and 12% had a graduate degree of some sort, a master's level or higher. Um, so a lot of us, if, uh, when we were working, or if we are still working, we still attend continuing education events and seminars and conferences so that we can continue to grow in our fields. Uh, Dan, you gotta keep up with all the latest in technology for your field so that you're ahead of the game, right? Um, Pete, does Rockwell send you uh, some continuing ed stuff? Yeah, sure. Yeah, because you gotta, you gotta keep up with that. Same with us theologians, you know, we, we are required to do at least a uh, certain number, I think it's like 40 hours of continuing ed every year um, for our own learning. Um, so a lot of us do that, and we understand that gain knowledge helps us improve ourselves. So um, one, of the, one of the reasons why we continue to gain knowledge is we want to better ourselves. So we, we understand that knowledge is power. So why am I talking about identity and knowledge? Well, um, because when it comes to who we are as Christians, a lot of our identity is tied into knowing God. Um, and now, I want to make a distinction here. There is a difference, in my mind, between knowing God and knowing about God. Knowing about God is textbook, right. Uh, religious studies, being able to list the facts. Well, Christians usually worship on Sunday. They believe in a Trinitarian God. Uh, you know, I'm talking about the history of, of Jesus. I'm talking about what goes into writings, you know, knowledge about God about Christianity. Um, but that isn't knowledge of knowing God. Knowledge of knowing God is theological. It's how we come to understand how God interacts with us, how we interact with God, how God interacts with creation and the world, how God lives in relationship with us, how God lives in relationship with us. That's, the, that's knowing God. Knowing God is very much a theological question as opposed to just knowing God. I mean, and it's not to say that it's not good to know about the facts of God, because if you're going to be a Christian, well, you need to know that Christians usually worship on Sundays. Uh, you need to know that we celebrate Holy Communion, Holy Baptism. You need to know those things. Um, but you also, we also want to go deeper than that so that we can really get to know God. So how do we, how do we learn about God? Well, we have different sources, right? And again, this is not an exhaustive list, but um, we have sources in the Bible. That's a big one. How do we know about the history of God and God's people? Uh, we turn to the Bibles for that. Um, the sacraments. God, uh, Lutherans believe that God's presence is fully available in uh, word and sacrament, in the bread and wine, and communion, in the, the waters of baptism. So uh, we look to the sacraments get to better understand God and understand that the sacraments are a means of grace. Our liturgy, our liturgy is designed to be carried out in such a way that we are to uh, come to see God's presence among us, uh, to see what God is doing in the world. Um, theological writings, uh, poems, uh, mystical uh, writings, sermons, you know, uh, my, my preaching on God's Word is one of the ways that we uh, help to better ourselves to know God, as through my interpretation of the Scripture, uh, but also through other theologians and their writings, um, through Christian mystics and their experiences of God. All that stuff helps us to get to know God better. Um, and then we have the witness of the saints in history, the church fathers and, and people of that age, people that have gone before us that have talked about their experiences of knowing God and have passed on the faith to us. And of course, then we have also the witness of present-day saints, uh, those of us who are still living, who go out and, and witness God's gospel to the world, uh, and who um, 
lift each other up in prayer and, and do what we can to share our understanding of who God is and engage in that conversation. Uh, so we have all these different sources that help us to understand um, how to better understand God, how to know God. And of course, all of this tells us the story about God, of who God, the story of God, and God's people. And what, what these do is they help us to identify who we are as Christians. They help us to identify who we are as Christians um, in terms of how God interacts with us, how God loves us, and kind of, you could say, God's expectations of <coughs> us as God's people. Um, and it, share, it shares the, the story of God's redemptive acts. It's how we know that God saved the entire world. It's how we know that we are saved through God's grace by faith. It's how we know that Jesus was fully human and fully God, that Jesus was a historical person. Uh, it's how we come to know that we are forgiven, um, that we uh, can pray, how we should pray. All of the aspects of our faith come from knowing God and knowing about God. Um, and so that knowledge know God is to grow in faith, right? To know God is to grow in faith, because how else are we supposed to grow in faith if we don't know God, if we don't encounter God, right? I mean, can you believe in Bigfoot if you've never experienced Bigfoot? Or know What is it to experience Bigfoot? Well, yeah, there you go. Good question. Like pictures of him? It? Well, what gets people into the hype of Bigfoot? Historic pictures, stories, uh, encounters, yeah, specific sightings, possible history of Bigfoot's natural habitat and things of that nature. Supposed evidence. You know, supposed evidence, right? I mean, and some yes. people believe it, some people don't. Uh, but without any of that, you'd never be able to believe in Bigfoot at all. Same with, with God. It, it's that under, we understand that God reveals God's self to us, and the way we come to understanding God is through um, faith experiences, through growing in knowledge of God. That part is key to this presentation, so hold on to that. So where we see some issues now as we talk about dementia is we have a couple different dimensions, you know, <laughs> definitions of dementia here, just so that we can better understand what dementia is. Um, Dictionary.com's definition is a severe impairment or loss of the uh, inter intellectual capacity and personality integration due to the loss of or damage of neurons in the brain. Um, and then, of course, the International Classification of Diseases has a much longer definition of syndrome due to disease of the brain, usually of a chronic or progressive nature, in which there is disturbance of multiple higher cortical functions, including memory, thinking, orientation, comprehension, calculation, learning, capability, language, and judgment. Consciousness is not in there. Impairments of cognitive function are commonly accompanied, occasionally preceded by deterioration of emotional control, social behavior, or motivation. So there you go. Now, a lot of us, when we think of dementia, what do we think of? Alzheimer's, right? The truth of the matter is dementia is much bigger than Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's is just one expression of dementia. However, out of all the cases of dementia in the United States, Alzheimer's so it, it's the one that usually gets the most attention. But there are a lot of other forms of dementia as well, besides Alzheimer's. Um, so now here's, here's an interesting thing. 
if how we come to faith goes in knowing God, then how does that play into the fact that dementia uh, impairs memory and thinking and comprehension and learning abilities? In other, come back to that one. Uh, in other words, if a person loses the ability to know God, will they lose faith and therefore lose God? That is the theological quandary that I at least have been wrestling with this the more I have talked about the care of people with dementia uh, in my classes and such. This is the, this is the theological quandary that comes to mind. And a second one, if our loved one's personality changes because one of the things with dementia is that the person completely changes from who we knew them to be. They become a completely different person in terms of personality. If that personality changes, are they still the same person God made them to be? So those are some of the theological questions that I've been wrestling with. Um, because what we observe in people with dementia is we observe a loss of identity. Because people with dementia begin to lose their memories. Uh, they begin to lose their personality. They begin to lose their relationships. You know, people with severe dementia um, won't recognize their own children or their own spouses. You know, um, they won't remember certain aspects of their lives. Um, their, like I said, their personality changes. Um, some people that have a very progressive form of dementia, they become very violent as the disease, and, and, and it just it flabbergasts families because they wonder, who is this person? This isn't the same loving, caring person that I knew. Why are they all of a sudden so violent? Right.
in my experience, William, what gets explained is the technical, like what you just yeah. explained. How here's what's happening in the brain. Here's other neurons that's breaking down. This is why this person is acting in this way. And that and that's good for a medical understanding. It's good to, you know, for a technical understanding of what's going on with the person. That can be helpful to some. But that still doesn't address the philosophical or the theological that's running it through our brain. Because um, even if we do get the, answer, the technical answers to our questions, that still leaves us wondering, who okay. is this person? Why are they still here? Or, you know, things of that nature. <coughs> you know, the, 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 the philosophical and the theological get left unanswered because our, our care providers, the, the, the medical, they're, they're not trained to answer these questions. They're trained to answer the technical. And that's their realm of expertise, you know. But where do we turn to? for the philosophical and the theological, the wrestling with our understanding of where this, how God is still with this person. When we were on this journey with my mom, um, we were very fortunate that she did not have any anger issues at all. But, you know, back to the, the theological thing, I think I saw her when she was in worship So, to begin wrestling with these theological questions, um, one of the things that I've had to wrestle with, and I've read about, and, and heard other speakers talk about, is this question of, so who are we really? Are we simply just our memory? Are we simply just our likes and dislikes? Are we simply our emotions? Are we simply our vocations? Are we simply our relationship? Because if we view identity in terms of those things, and, and, and a lot of us do, we can 
can understand why dementia is such a devastating disease, because when we lose these things, we feel like we've lost the person that we know and love. And in some cases, there is truth to it. I'm not trying to downplay it. We've lost it. There is grief to be addressed with that. And we'll talk about that a little bit towards the end. Uh, so I'm not downplaying that. But in terms of answering this theologically, um, how do we, how do we know who we are? That's really the question. And also, there's also the question, are we more than just our brains? Are we more than just our brains? One of the things I found interesting in the International Center for Diseases definition is it said that consciousness is not affected, which I think is very fascinating. In the, in the definition of dementia for the International Center for Diseases, uh, they said that consciousness is not affected. So that's interesting. Just something to talk about. Um, but Because our brains control everything, don't they? Our brains really do control everything. And there's so much mystery surrounding our brain. We barely, we, we, you know, we've heard the concept of the infinite mind. There's so much about our brains that we don't understand yet. I was going to say, that, that brings to ask the question, do our brains really control everything? Right. We don't know everything right. about the brain. But the example that this speaker gave, I thought was great, is he said that, we can't control our brains. And he gave this example. Yellow jeep. How many of you started thinking about a yellow jeep? Right? Yeah, it just pops in there. You can't really stop it, right? The image just pops in there. Right? It's, that's our brain. So, so what? So are we more than just our brain? Are we more than just what we think? or what's stored in the memory banks of our brains. That's really kind of the essence to get at this theological question. Are we more than our minds? As a baptized child of God then, God never leaves us, correct? Go on. So even if that person is in the, the stages of dementia, God, in my mind,
feel like there might be a difference between God always being with them on their journey and their awareness of the journey entirely. Like Pete said, sometimes in the advanced stages of dementia, they're not very aware of, of much of anything. So, like, Pastor used the example of Jesus loved you. Like, you know, how aware of Christ are they? And, and obviously, I would like to assume that that would not make much of a difference on whether or not they will, you know, receive. Is that going to play into their interest in the heaven? Yeah, exa- I don't think, you know. I don't think it's going to. I... It's the debate about is an unbaptized person or like an emergency baptism if right. somebody hasn't been baptized. And then if they're in a vegetative state and you go to the hospital and baptize them. I mean, is that doing some kind of magic that then will make them more saved than they would have been just by, you know, by God's grace? As you put it, then that magic should be taking that away from them now. But are you taking the disease away? Right. Right. Yeah. Just like God cured leprosy or... Well, that, that gets to the nature of why are why is any oh, disease? Okay, okay. We're, <laughs> yeah, we're, yeah. We're, we're going into a way. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that's a whole other Let's go read the book of Job. <laughs> Theologians have been discussing that question for centuries. Yeah. So. Is it possible that God could call you back before the lights go out? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? He is wondering if it's possible for God to call you back before the lights go can't lose his moment? Well, no, no. I'm saying it's not it gets called back, but the body is still here, but it's just the body. So God called But the back soul, ready, but God has so taken the soul already. I mean, yeah. you know, what I'm saying is, you know, your consciousness and everything is, well, what we said, that there's no consciousness. Is it possible? I mean, you wrestle with that too, but is it just the house no sitting there with nobody in it? You know what I'm saying? I mean, with nothing. God's already well, there, that's a little difficult, yeah. and, and I know that's that. because um, that, that starts venturing into Gnosticism, which is this understanding that our body is a prison, and we are trying to free ourselves from our body, from our prisons, to be one with God. So that whole body and soul separation. Um, but a lot of our scriptures don't point to that. They point more to an understanding that body and soul are one. So that's that's a, that's a little bit more difficult for at least with Lutheran understanding to, to separate the two. So that's one of the reasons why this question is so difficult for us to wrestle. Well, we have been um, close to people who have terminal cancer, and they have been boosted enough for their family to get there and to say goodbye before my two hours.
reason they're still around is because their body has shut down. They're still, they're still functioning. Their body is still, the heart is still pumping, uh, the brain is still message, sending messages. Um, so from, we can look at that from a medical standpoint and say, okay, well that's why they're still here, because their body is still functioning. But that doesn't help us on a theological or philosophical and you don't have the same kind of decision you have when the person signs the board. You say, right. Well, just pull the plug. It's not going to go. You can't make that decision. No, you can't. Not with dementia. No. You don't have any control over how long it will take for that to deteriorate. You know. So you all are wrestling with this <laughs> wonderfully, by the way. There's no easy answers here. Like I said, nothing easy about this. Um, so keep, keep on wrestling with these questions. But um, so as I wrestled with this, thinking about are we more than just our brains? Is the essence of our being more than just our brains and our bodies? Um, and so one of the things that came up for me was Psalm 139. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book. For one of them came to me. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God, how vast is the sum of them. There's a, this isn't in this part of Psalm 139, but we know so far about Psalm 139 where the psalmist says, You knew me before I knew myself. You know? Um, and so what this kind of directs us to is this understanding that God formed us before we even had a physical body. God knew us before we were even formed in our mother's womb. Just think about that for a second. Isn't that kind of mind-blowing? Before our parents even knew that we were conceived, God knew us. That is an amazing thing to think about. And it makes me wonder, Understanding that God seems to know us before we even know ourselves, before we were even formed, God seemed to know who we are. And of course, you knew baptism was going to come into play here, didn't you? Oh, Lent. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, um, baptism, uh, you know, the understanding that we are created in God's image. The, the theological term is the Imago, the imago Dei. Uh, we have the image of God within us. Um, and so, our, you could make the argument that, we, that our very essence is in God. If we have the Imago Dei, if that means we are made in the image of God, that we have the image of God in us, we are very much in the essence of God. Uh, and in addition to that, when we were baptized, we were baptized into Christ Jesus, right? We were baptized into his death and resurrection, um, but the understanding in baptism is that we put on Christ. We take on the Imago Christi, the image of Christ, into us. And it's at our baptism where Christ comes down and abides in us. And so we are connected to God. So much so that we become Christ-like. Now again, like I said in my sermon, we aren't ever going to become Christ ourselves, but we become Christ-like.
because Christ is residing in us um, and it abides in us forever. And as kind of as Robin alluded to, and kind of what I kind of feel is also true, is that the presence of Christ will not leave us. Even if we lose all memory of God, God will not forget us. And I think that there is key. That even if we forget God, God will not forget us. Again, we were fearfully and wonderfully made. God knew us before we even knew ourselves. God knew us before we were even formed in our mother's womb. God will not forget us. If you study the scriptures, they are full of stories of God remembering God's people. And you can easily attribute that understanding that when God remembers God's people, there is life. So that, that's, a, that's a hard question to think about, Bruce, because you just, you just don't know where that's coming from. But I guess where I find comfort is knowing that even in those moments of denouncement, whether they're conscious or not, that doesn't stop God from forgetting us. Or that doesn't, that doesn't cause God to forget us. by Romans 8, which we read usually a lot at funerals. Um, it's read sometimes during the lectionary year. Uh, but, For I am convinced that neither life yes, nor no death life. nor angels nor demons neither the present nor the future nor any powers neither height nor depth in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Paul went down there. Nothing going to separate you from God. Absolutely nothing. There's no asterisk there. There's no asterisk. <laughs> That's right. There's no asterisk. I'm going to see a Bible. There's like a footnote. <laughs> but another way to kind of understand that God doesn't forget is to also understand that we don't. When a loved one dies, do we just simply forget them? No. We relive their memories. Whether it's our memories of them or memories they share with us. We retell stories about them. We pass on their teachings and advice. We remember them. We remember who they were. And I think 
that is also key. Because the essence of who they are, not only is that tied to God, but it's also tied in the memories of others. They are not forgotten. So even when they can't remember who they are, or who you are, or who God is, we remember for them. Which can make this, this is one of the reasons it makes it devastating. Because we want them so desperately to remember, too. But they can't. The disease doesn't allow them to. So we remember for them. So it is God not forgetting us, and it's us not forgetting them either. And so they live on to this unforgetfulness. I don't know about the word. Theologians are allowed to make books, by the way. God never forgets us even when we forget. So, with, so that's kind of how we start wrestling with these theological questions. That understanding that God doesn't forget us. That we don't forget the person, even if they forget themselves. And that understanding that God knows us better than we know ourselves, knew us before anybody else did. That our essence really is in God, which for me brings up all kinds of new possibilities, not even just with dementia, but with other mental disabilities as well. Or other or other things. It, it kind of goes back to that question, you know, one of the questions that theologians like to ask to tease each other and talk about is: okay, if a, if a child is born and never grows up to know anything about God, are they still saved? Yes, sir. Yeah. And we say, and what if our if we are more than our knowledge, if we are more than our brain, if our essence is truly tied into God, then I gotta believe that yes, that is possible. I can't say definitively. <laughs> Baptism is necessary, but not necessarily necessary. Okay, right. Because that goes on to the other side. Baptism is the fire insurance. You, know, you don't need baptism to be saved. Baptism is a welcoming word. I tell people baptism is a gift for the living. Because when you when you die, you don't need it anymore. Because when you die, you're, you're ventured into God's care for all eternity. So you don't need baptism. Well, we call it an entrance right. It is an entrance right into the body of Christ. Oh, it's a sacrament, a sacred, sacred act. Well, it is a sacred action, yes. It, it, it is a, it's still a sacrament. That doesn't take away from it. There's still the means of God's grace within it. Though. But it is not the requirement for salvation. Excuse me, Catholics have an entrance right. Yeah, for, for it. Okay. God's grace Catholics. Catholics yeah, will So there's a lot of interesting questions here. 
But I want to talk a little bit about, uh, with the few minutes we have left, um, caring for people with dementia and also talk a little bit about how we get through the grief of dementia. Um, so one of the things that's really important to remember with people from dementia is people who suffer from dementia only have the ability to live in the present moment. And that becomes more and more true as the disease progresses. They only have the ability to live in the present moment. So what their reality is, is the present moment. It's not anything in the future. It's not anything in the past. It's where they're at, right in that present moment. But it could be the past, because you're talking and not sharing the same. It could be, but as they get, as the disease progresses more and more, they lose that ability. Great. Yeah. What were you saying? You think well, it, it depends on what stage they're in, but whether 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 they are, because there are, you're right, Linda, there's plenty of times with dementia patients we'll talk about how they're doing things that happened in the past. But that is their present reality. That re their present moment is their reality, whether that is talking, whether they say, Oh yeah, George stopped by, and George has been dead for 20 years. That's their present reality, and we have to remember that. That's where they're at. That's, that, to them, is the presence, and that's their present moment. And to them, that's all they have. Do you know if doctors have, or you know, neurologists and things, have, have found that there's something in the brain that, that is not allowing them to is it, is, are you saying that they're not like thinking or comprehending the future or past really other than that they may be, you know, incidentally what I'm is living back then? They aren't aware. Or? They aren't aware of anything except their present reality. Okay. So they're not necessarily aware, like, like I said, the, the brother George example. Yeah. They're not aware that George has been dead for 20 years. It also depends on what time they have. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So that information is still there, but it, it's blocked. So it, and I can, into the subconscious mind, that never leaves. It's the frontal lobe that affects. So and every so often it might kind of. Every once in a while there is a short circuit where and the open. circuit opens and then closes. Yeah. And then they'll get a bit of information and then it's gone. Yeah. Yeah. There's lots of people that have studied more about the technical side of That's one of the things we can do. Yeah. And I don't, I don't think I put it on this list here, but that is definitely one of the things that they encourage us to do is to study more about the disease so that we are well informed of what is happening. But, but in terms of caring for them, we need to understand that their present moment is their present moment and they don't really know anything different than that present moment. Um, like I said, their present moment is what is truly and trying to correct that reality actually just makes it more confusing for them. This is especially true as the disease progresses. And we, we have a tendency to want to do that because we are still trying to help them hold on to whatever they can hold on to. Uh, and so we're like, so we'll be like, oh, no, 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 it's, it's Sunday. It's not Tuesday, it's Sunday. Mom, don't you remember George died 20 years ago? You know, and they'll just kind of give you this, my experience, they'll just kind of give you sort of, oh, okay, you know. Um, it's just, it's not really helpful to try and correct them, to just let them be in 
whatever is their present reality. Um, and uh, even though they will most likely forget <laughs> the present moment, well, while in that moment, it is special to them. So just because they start, uh, the disease continues to progress and they start forgetting things, doesn't mean that we can we have to stop doing things like that. Um, there was a story in one of the articles I read about how this uh, memory unit at this care center took these folks to the zoo. And uh, they went to the zoo, they went on the tram ride, they took them around the zoo, and they got to see all the animals. And while they were doing that, they were enjoying themselves. And afterwards, they got back on the bus, and um, Somebody asked, so what did you think of the zoo? And the person's response was, we didn't go to the zoo, I don't know the zoo, what are you talking about? But in that present moment, while they were experiencing the zoo, they were enjoying themselves. So again, the present moment is what's key for them. So just because they, they start developing dementia and start losing their memory, Understanding of who they are and who we are doesn't mean that we want to isolate them. I mean, there comes a time where they become a danger to themselves, of course, and they need to be under watchful care. But, you know, we can still engage them, we can still do things with them. And so engaging them in the moment. So we can so we continue to build relationships with them. Even if they're going to forget 15 minutes later, we still build relationships. We still continue to engage them in worship, even though they might forget the experience. There was another story shared in that same article about how this woman took her mother to church every Sunday, even though her mother had advanced stages of dementia. Um, and her mother would forget five minutes later that they went to church. However, if mom didn't go to church in a week, by Tuesday, she was crawling up the walls of the care center and driving Nurses uh, Again, living in those present moments. Um, so continuing to engage them in worship, even though they might forget. Continuing to remember God for them. Now that doesn't mean that, you know, we have to every time they say who Jesus have to explain who Jesus is. But we just remember God for them. We remember that they are God's beloved child. We remember that God is still very present with them. Remember that they they are in God's care. Uh, we pray with them, can sing his hymn, sing hymns with them or to them. That is always one of the fascinating things about how that music it, it really creates the subconscious and the long term memory to come back into into play, and they can just pick it up like they never forgot. Um, and then, of course, to remind ourselves that they are in God's care. Very important. So dealing with the grief, and uh, I see that we're out of time, so um, we'll try to run through this quickly. Um, there are two paths that we can follow when dealing with grief, and this applies to more than just dementia, this can apply to any kind of grief. There is the destructive path, path, which is we're denying our grief. We don't want to act like it's there. We don't want to act. We want to act like everything's hunky dory and nothing happened. And then we have the healthy path, which is acknowledging our losses. Um, so those are really hard to see. Yes, um, but they both start with loss, and the destructive past then leads to hurt and anger. Um, resentment, bitterness. Resentment and bitterness, chronic distress, illness, um, placing ourselves in the role of the victim and a martyr, forgetting. Uh, and that's a very that's very destructive. It can actually lead to 
to more pain and more anguish. Whereas, we, if we choose to acknowledge our, our loss, um, then comes uh, commitment, uh, tell, story. tell stories. Storytelling is a big part of the feeling process. Working through the feelings, that's one reason why a lot of people want to deny their grief is because they don't want to work through the pain. That, but that's ever important. Um, for um, integration. integration, reflection, uh, contentment. Now, what can happen is there are, depending on the level of grief and the type of grief, we can find ourselves on the destructive path at first because sometimes it's really hard to recognize our grief. And it's, um, what, 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 what the person who made this, what they, said, what they say is, a lot of times it's an unconscious decision to start down a destructive path. But usually we can get to a point, or sometimes it requires help of others to get to a point where we can recognize, oh, I'm still grieving. I haven't been able to cope with this very well. Uh, and so I need, I need to be given the process of getting working through my grief. So, and the reason this plays in with dementia is because, like I said, it is a loss. And no matter how much you've gotten out of my presentation, no matter how many times you read up on the disease and you're well informed of everything technical that's happening uh, and you wrestle with these questions, it still never prepares you for that moment when your loved one doesn't recognize you anymore. And so it is, it is a difficult thing. It is, it, is, it is a loss. And so That's why I also tell people, don't tell somebody, oh, that person died over a year ago. Why aren't you open that yet? Because that's not helpful, because they may still be trying to work through that. Okay. I know we're over time, but are there any uh, questions or further conversation? Like I said, we can continue the discussion next week.